I'm Mari Baloney at Davidson College, and what I'm going to be talking to you about are some of the tools that uh, we've created. One at Fizzlets, the Easy Java Simulations program, and the programs that we've made with that program, with the idea of thinking about how you could use the simulations and curriculum material that we've created to teach uh, both physics and astronomy. This is uh, a large uh, group of people. The other uh, major person is Wolfgang Christian, Doug Brown, who uh, created the Tracker Video Analysis Program, Ann Cox, Francisco Scambre, who uh, created the Easy Java Simulation Tool, and, and others. So just as an overview, the open source physics project and set of resources uh, are basically curriculum resources to, for faculty to engage students in the teaching of physics and astronomy, but also computer modeling and also computation. So we have our, you know, think of computation basically as a three-legged stool. You've got stuff that's completed that students use. You want students to kind of get their hands dirty to do a little bit of computation. And then you really want real physics computation, computational physics. And we have tools to do, to do all of those. So I'm just going to kind of summarize. the. Uh, overarching collection is called the Open Source Physics Collection. It has over 500 uh, simulations, JavaScript and, well, I should say Java and a handful of JavaScript simulations right now. Um, it basically was created for more advanced uh, physics and also for computational physics. Uh, added to that are our collection of Fizzlets, which are small uh, interactive Java applets that run in a web page. We have now two collections on Compadre. One is Fizzit Physics Second Edition. We had the first edition of this interactive book was, was actually a book you could buy with a CD in it. The second edition is now completely electronic, totally redone, and is on the Compadre website. And it's now totally free. We also have material for teaching of modern physics, both at the introductory level, modern physics level, and also uh, quantum physics that's useful both at the sophomore level and all the way up to senior level. And that collection has over 200 uh, individual pieces of curriculum material for teaching that topic. Also in here is a tool that I'll, I'll demo a little bit later called Easy Java Simulations. The idea is to give students a, a tool so that they can do basic programming in Java without having to learn, at least not a, initially, all the kind of overhead. We want them to be quickly immersed in kind of a computational environment without worrying about all sorts of other stuff, to just get the basic idea of computation as fast as possible. The great thing is that it also allows us to write simulations very uh, quickly and efficiently. And you can see the little asterisk is that the new version of this will also create simulations uh, in JavaScript. And then also is the tracker video analysis tool. Allows you to do video analysis. It's a free, uh, free tool as well. Now here are all the sites. So you should busily be writing all of them down, except don't. The only one you really need to learn and write down and to memorize and to tattoo on your forearm, right, is www.compadre.org slash OSP. That site is kind of the, the master site. And all of these other materials, as it turns out, we've been working with the Compadre folks as to how you could go from one of these groups of material to the other one in a very simple way. The way we've done that is at the bottom of each of these collections. So at the bottom of the open source physics collection, Fizzlet Physics and Fizzlet Quantum Physics, there's a little bar. Okay. And it's called the OSP network because we're more, much more interested in doing kind of the geeky computation of getting that on there and scripting than naming stuff. So basically at the bottom of every page in these collections, you can easily go to something else. So OK, I'm in the middle of optics and phys physics, and I realize, well, wait, my next class is modern physics, so I need something from special relativity. All you have to do is click on that link at the bottom of the page, and it'll immediately take you to the other collection. So to try and give people both an easy way to navigate, 
but also see that all of these resources basically came from the same place. Uh, the open source physics network, for lack of a better uh, name. So I'm going to, those of you who are already on the site and goofing around, have fun. Or pay attention, whichever you would like to do. So I have a question. Why might we want to use simulations in teaching physics? Right, so I can tell you about simulations for the next, till Bob comes in and kicks us out of here. What, but why? Why do you care? Um, sometimes, especially like in quantum mechanics, it's really hard to find a demonstration that could really illustrate like wave, you know, interference and double, double slit. It's okay. It's really cool one that you can't, it's really hard to do. Right, so there are experiments that are hard to do, whether it's hard, they're expensive, they happen too, things happen too quickly, they happen too slowly, they're too large, can't really do them safely, all those sorts of reasons. What else? Can you do a <coughs> visual way of uh, exploring the effect of parameters on the solution? Yes, Vi so two effects there. So two things you talked about, the visualization. I can add an extra visualization, right? Not only, so I, I can talk about a car moving along at a constant speed, but I might not really have a sense of what that really means until I actually see it. And then adding the fancy name multiple representations, right? I can now add a graph to it and see what the graph looks like. And not a finished graph like in a textbook, but a graph where each data point is being added as I see the car moving. So that I can get a better understanding, hopefully, through a visualization of what's going on. Okay, anybody else? You can also control parameters see yeah. how they influence each other. Right, control and change parameters. You know, I only have a certain amount of mass for my carts uh, on my, uh, you know, the, the tracks that I have. I can add 100 grams at a time, right? But what if I want to do a whole bunch of experiments and try and do it easily? I can change parameters that way. Um, with our quantum stuff, what we do is we add perturbations to a well so we can do non-standard quantum mechanics and look at what the energy eigenfunctions look like. Things that you can't solve analytically. So to be able to give them different ideas other than the standard examples. So those are all great reasons why we'd want to use simulations in I teaching physics. Yes? Um, I find that the that students are, um, they, they, they're not intimidated by them in the same way they are some other things. Um, I don't know if it's uh, a growing trend or not, but they're, they're my, I find my students will seek out uh, simulations on their own. Mm -hmm. um, And they don't have to worry about, if I go ahead and I increase the capacitance by a factor of 10, will I blow the capacitor? And if I do, who cares? Because I just click another button and it comes back, as opposed to what happens in the laboratory. Yeah, so they're, they're and, and also are the new generation. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say that, that I think, you know, maybe it's a lot of video games makes it sort of comfortable mm -hmm. to them, but, um, but I think they like them. And, and that also brings a, another problem, which is how do we know what we're seeing in a simulation is correct? And I've got a, a, at least one example of that. I'll show you just one simulation here quickly. This is one uh, simulating, a 3D simulation simulating the, the mice which are a pair of colliding galaxies. Uh, this was actually, yes, Mike. It's slow because we're recording, don't worry. So here we have the two colliding galaxies. This was done by a sophomore physics major in our computational physics class. He did a general simulation for his final project of colliding galaxies. Uh, a few years ago, somebody in our uh, department had done just a regular two dimension. This was now, he wanted to extend it to three dimensions. And the problem from, I think it was the 70s, Tomare and Tomare, basically using a supercomputer to do a similar thing. Now we can do it on the desktop and have undergraduates program it. Uh, the other thing, so here is that the time frame, he set up all the parameters. He was able to find all the parameters online to have the initial conditions set so that you would get something look very much like the mice. And you can see also that, you know, 
I know my talk will seem long at the end because it's the afternoon, but 320 million years didn't actually pass in real time. Um, so it allows us to do, to do other things like that. Okay. So just briefly, I, I think I said this already, when we use simulations, there are a couple of different ways we can think about using simulations with students. One is that they're just interacting with a pre-made simulation, so they're basically just users of the simulation. Uh, we want them to hopefully interact with the simulation in a meaningful way. The other is to give students kind of the modeling uh, activity where essentially you give them a program or a package with a simple user interface and they add some physics or they change some things to try and model the behavior. And then finally, full-blown computational physics where they're really programming. And so we have tools to do, to do all of these things. What level of course is appropriate for simulations? Any, all, good, good answer. There we go, all, okay? But to remember that what you're gonna expect of your students, right? I might show the mice in my introductory astronomy course, I have a very different outcome there and, and expectation than I would in my advanced classical mechanics class. But expectation a, uh, outcomes and then what scaffolding you put around them is important, okay? Keeping in mind the less sophisticated the student, you want a nice robust user interface for those folks so that it's simple. They don't get lost in kind of dealing with parameters. And finally, and of course more interactive the better, and then finally keep in mind technology without pedagogy is just technology. These are just simulations. Often you, you know, people say, well, are simulations good or bad? Well, it really depends how you're using them and what scaffolding you have around them. They're neither good or, or bad, okay? So I'm just gonna give a couple of examples of some of the stuff we have that students could use in the kind of user mode. Uh, so what pedagogies that you've learned about that maybe you could use with simulations? You've been here for a few days. Some of what you've done is learn about pedagogies, right? Okay, so just-in-time teaching, like maybe an interactive lecture demonstration. Just-in-time teaching. You could ask what's going to happen when I change this parameter. They could discuss. Yep, so game. peer instruction, okay could give them as homework, you could give them like we do as like a pre-lab exercise. So pretty, pretty much, much everything that you've learned about in terms of pedagogies, you could match with an appropriate simulation as long as the scaffolding and the, what you're asking the students is targeted toward what you're, you're thinking about. So you can add a lot, of, you know, a lot of stuff, so maybe it's more like a guided inquiry or a tutorial, you could add less uh, description, and now it's a homework problem. So you can decide how you actually want to do that and use that. So I've mentioned this before, I'm just going to show uh, these collections and then give you a couple of examples from the collections. This is the Phys Physics Collection, 800 uh, Interactive Java Simulations for Teaching Intro Physics from Mechanics to Optics. That's what the site is, but if you go to the Open Source Physics site, you've got the little bar at the bottom, you can easily navigate to this. And then our modern physics, quantum mechanics stuff, is like quantum physics, which has over 200 examples for um, exercises for teaching modern physics. So here's one example. This We use uh, first day of lab, actually. So I click the link, and I can click position matching. And what students are to do is to drag the rear bumper of the monster truck and match the graph. You guys might have either seen this or done this before with like a motion sensor where you, somebody walks in front of the motion sensor and you see what the graph looks like and you're trying to match the motion. Here what it is, is you're actually using the, using the simulation. We like doing this in our intro lab where we have people uh, go from one lab partner to the next. The first lab partner gets the position, the second one gets velocity. It's a little bit harder to do to match the velocity curve than it was the position curve. At this point, students want to change their lab partners. <laughs> then have them go back to the original lab partner to try and match the acceleration versus time graph. <laughs> and I won't even bother. And this is with like 10 point smoothing and all sorts of other good stuff to make it a little less chaotic. But the question is 
which one of these graphs was easiest to match and which one was the hardest? Position was the easiest, velocity in the middle, and acceleration the hardest. But the, the good question is why? Base your answer on physics and mathematics. What's the difference between position, trying to match position graph, the velocity graph, and the acceleration graph? Say again? Okay, but 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 yeah, they can compare, but why? What is what is different about position matching and velocity than velocity matching? What's different than velocity and acceleration matching? Rate of change. Rate of change. They're each a rate of change, right? Velocity is the rate of change of position. And the acceleration is the rate of change of velocity, which is itself the rate of change. So depending on what your students know about calculus, either they talk about derivatives, so you're trying to match a couple of derivatives here. Um, the other thing is that we can talk about you know, what happens with trying to do, when I've got multiple points, what happens when one point is bad, one point is a little bit high or a little bit low, it's going to affect points on either side if we have a velocity graph or an acceleration graph. So this is one example. And again, I'm just showing the typical examples, which means I'm showing the best ones. Okay. Let me load this one. This is one from electrostatics. And so it basically asks you, and this is a, a problem from uh, tasks inspired by physics education and research, a group of questions. So what, if anything, is wrong with this animation? Okay. So what I can do, I'm getting the force vectors. I can bring ball B over here. I bring A, and A a track, which means what? They're, they're different, they're opposite, okay? Now I bring D over here, and these repel so they're the same, so these should be... Oh no, something's wrong, <laughs> right? <laughs> so in this particular simulation, there are not two charges. Turns out that the way it's modeled is there are like three charges. And so it's not they're just positive, negative, this doesn't obey what we would normally think in typical electrostatics. So the what, if anything, is wrong kind of thing allows us to, to actually show them incorrect physics and have them tell us why is the physics incorrect, which is a neat kind of way of doing problems. And then we'll do this one. This is one of my favorites. <coughs> to determine the focal length of a mirror, So we're given this, so we have our point source, we have our mirror, and we have some rays. What would your students think as far as where the focal length or focal point of that mirror is? Yeah, where the rays cross, right? Because they were sort of paying attention when we said something like that, right? But the problem is, is if you move this around, and where the rays cross or, you know, changes, okay? So that doesn't work. So what do I have to do? I have to know something about what does it mean for a mirror to have a, a focal point. So where should I move this point source? Okay, to infinity, I can't because I got limited real estate. But what I can do is what? Look at the ray that comes in parallel as if it was way off at infinity see where it crosses the principal axis, and that's going to be the focal point, and so therefore that's the focal length. Okay, what else? Yes, sure. So it would confirm, put it on the principal axis, at that point, and now those diverging rays should come off parallel. Okay, what else? Say it again. Okay. Well, uh, uh, move, keep moving this until weird happens. What's that point? Curvature. That's the, yeah, the radius of curvature, where those diverging rays are going to come back on themselves, which is twice the focal length. Okay. And now I could also do one other thing. So, so far, none of what we've talked about involves an equation. It really involves you thinking about what does it mean to have a mirror, and what does it mean for that mirror to have a focal point? What I can do now is I could actually say, well, this is going to be my uh, object, 
So imagine an object here, this distance away from the mirror. I assume that that's going to generate an image here and get my image distance. And now if I really wanted to, I could use an equation. So there are multiple different ways of solving this. Only the last one that I talked about really involves an equation. So it forces you to think conceptually first. And you can imagine giving this as a just-in-time teaching exercise, getting a whole bunch of different answers, having them come into class and discussing amongst themselves the, with peer instruction which answer might be correct, and actually convincing themselves there might be more than one answer that's correct, uh, just by using the simulation. <clears throat> Here's one of my favorite uh, exercises on uh, phys quantum physics, um, just because it's horribly complicated. And basically, you've got a periodic table. You click any of the elements, and it'll give you the emission spectrum of that element. So, I like that one. The collection has lots of different things, some stuff on statistics, some scattering. Got a lot of wave functions bouncing back and forth, because that's one of the things that I like to do. Uh, we've got uh, non-standard wells. So this actually mimics uh, what happens if you've got a defect uh, in, a, in a series of uh, quantum wells. This one is one where you've got a slider and you can change an infinite square well into a ramp infinite square well, so-called quantum bouncer problem. And so we can do, we've done, for this material, it's got material from special relativity, classical quantum correspondences, energy eigenfunction shape, time evolution scattering, some non-standard wells, atomic physics, and also statistical mechanics. And then, the overarching thing is, like I said before, the open source physics project. We also use the easy Java simulations, and we've written uh, at least 50 simulations for just-in-time teaching and also other uh, exercises for introductory physics. Here's one of an HR diagram. Here's one showing exoplanet transits, and, and that, that's not, I think, that's transit, and that one up there is uh, radial velocity. We have both. Um, and there are over 50 in a filing cabinet on Compadre, organized by the way I teach the course, which is bizarre. So naked eye astronomy, classical astronomy, and then modern astronomy. It's logical to me, it's all that matters to me. Um, this is about the uh, phase of the moon simulation, which Todd Timberlake at Berry College wrote. But moreover, it's if you go to a given thing on the Compadre site and you find a simulation, you can download the simulation. There's also supplemental material. So here we have uh, some lesson plans, a student version lesson plans. One is what I use uh, college level homework and another that a middle school teacher that we know uses for her middle school class. Uh, I show this because it took me about three months to write. Uh, so one of the other things we can do is to have students be modeling behavior. And this seems to work fairly well in introductory physics, um, especially in classical mechanics. And one of the ways we do this is with the tracker video analysis program, and I'll give you an example, and also with the Easy Java Simulations program, which is a free software program to write simulations. So what tracker looks like is this. Basically what we have is a window. You load a video in. You basically track a point, so this is the area around the North Celestial Bowl. You can then get a graph of your data points and also a data table to analyze things. An example from astronomy is that I basically took from the SDO site uh, an image from one of their cameras, one image a day, and made it into a movie. So we can see how the sunspots are moving over the course of the day with each of these steps. And then had my introductory astronomy students analyze this with the tracker video analysis program. So they put it into the tracker video analysis program, they track a sunspot, and they get a curve like that. I don't know why you might get a curve like that. The sun's not a disk, it's a <coughs> sphere. So you're seeing that circular motion projected onto a disk. Okay, so you're going to get a sinusoidal curve. What you can do is then get the period of that motion, and that'll tell you the uh, rotation rate of the sun, uh, the sun based on the sunspots. You can then go back and track something at a different latitude, and you can see differential rotation. 
the sun. All within an introductory astronomy course, just using simple video analysis tools and something that, a movie that was chosen. So the other thing we can do is we can create uh, Java simulations with, with the tool called Easy Java Simulations. And the idea behind Easy Java Simulations is it's supposed to make Java simulations easy. easy. <laughs> and it's really easier Java simulations, but it, it is actually pretty easy. And I'll give you an example. We'll do a quick example. Um, but the idea is that it gives you some of the scaffolding so that students can focus more on the computation and the physics. And so let me give you uh, an example, and I'm going to do this in five minutes or less, which you know is false advertising already. And I apologize that it, there's some uh, discrepancy between the screen that I have and this, which is giving those lines. They're not there normally. So here's the tool. It's a free tool. And so what should I do? I should click to create a description so I can describe what I'm doing. So I'm going to click here. I get something I can type. And now I can go click on the model. And now we can model a phenomena. Uh, because there are only about 3 million of these on the web, let's do the 3 million in first mass on a spring. Because it's also easy and fun. Okay. So let's try and model mass on a spring. The first thing we need to do is to instantiate some variables. So let's click here. Okay. What variables do I need for a mass on a spring? Mass. Mass. Spring constant. Mass. I'm a theorist, so the mass is one. Okay. Spring constant. Also one. <laughs> X position. Okay. Um, just to throw you a curveball, I'm going to put it at 0 0.8. When I do the, the automatic uh, uh, view of what I'm going to see, I know that it's going to default between plus and minus 1. So I want it on the screen, but not at the origin. OK, what else? OK, time. What else? OK, I could do that. What else? Say it again. Velocity. Velocity. OK. Let's have it start at rest. And so I could do a couple of different things. What I'm going to do is I'm going to also do dt here and give it a dt that's kind of small here. I could do some initializations of variables and other junk I'm not going to do. Evolution. So here's where we have to decide what we're going to do. We could create a page of code. Uh, we're not going to do that. Instead, we're going to create a page of ODEs, which sounds 10 times worse. So now you see something over here, and you go, well, d, d, that kind of looks like a derivative. So what should be my independent variable here? Time. Okay, and now it goes d, d, t. So now I'm going to set this as d, t. What is, what should I do as my first rate? d what, d, t? Yeah, d, x, d, t, which I think is v. What's the other thing that's going to change? And what's dv dt? A, which in this case is minus k over m times x. Okay. For all you computational geeks out there, I'll just click over here. If you can see, there are about 10 or so uh, different ways, different algorithms for solving the differential equation. Uh, we're going to just use the default here because it'll work perfectly fine. We can do fixed relations, custom, all sorts of other junk, but we're going to be interested in trying to create a view here. So I just click over here, and I drag. I get a magic wand, and what I get is a simulation window with a little object on it. I get some buttons, and now what I want to do is to make some edits. So I'm going to double click on the particle, and I get its properties. And what I really want to do is connect up the view to the model. And so what I have to tell it is the position of x, the position x of the ball is just x. That's all I really need. I could change the color and shape and do all sorts of stuff. Not interested in doing that at the moment. And now what you see over here is that the ball moved. It now takes the value that I give it in x. Okay? Could add a spring if I wanted to. What I'm going to do to make sure that we can see that the simulation is actually running 
is I'm going to add the variable t to um, t to the field. And now I'm just going to play it. Got to call it something. Yes, I did this already. And here's the running simulation. Okay. I could do it so that it starts paused. Here I just by default had it moving. What else could I do with this? Yes? Um, where do you download this from? So uh, if you go to the open source physics page at the bottom, there's easy Java simulations. Click there, and you'll get to the easy Java simulations page. And you go to the download, and you download it. OK? That's it. Nope. Nope. You just need, just need Java installed, because it's actually a Java program. And you can download it, install it. Works fine. In fact, our, our, our colleague who, who wrote this is primarily a Mac person. So this works perfectly fine. Now what do I want to do? This is great. I could add a spring. What else would I want to do with this? Change parameters. Yeah, be able to change parameters. What else? OK, add damping. OK. So where would I add damping? I'm going to kill that. Go back to the model and just add damping to here. Imagine how useful this would be in classical mechanics, where after about half the semester you're in Lagrangians and you get this nasty Lagrangian. You get the equations of motion that are this big that you can't solve. What does the textbook tell you to do? Do eight successive approximations to get the an in the order they want you to do to get the answer that they're expecting. As opposed to doing that, you can put the actual differential equation in here and see what the actual motion is. So here we have damping. That's great. One of the other things we could do is we could come over here and add a graph. Okay, So there's a plot. I'm going to go ahead and remove the buttons because we don't need them there. And now I can just decide what I want to plot. I want to plot x versus v because I'm a theorist. So that's what I get. So very quickly, I can go and I can I, I could you know add add parameters. So I could change parameters. I could add sliders. I could do all of those things. I could add a forcing motion. I could do all sorts of things. Okay. The other thing you can do is that with the with one of the buttons over here, this is running within Easy Java simulations. You can also package the simulation, and so it's a standalone Java Java program as well. So that's our, our tool. Is it only fit for ODE or also for PDFs? Uh, it, should, it works as well, yeah. Let me go back to where I'm supposed to be here. OK, so about five minutes. Um, written in Java, you can run them as standalone programs. Um, you can bundle programs together. And we actually distribute them from the uh, digital library. The other thing is, once you have something written with these eJava simulations, if you right click in it, you get a dialog and you can actually open within easy Java simulation. So any of the programs that are on Compadre, if you've downloaded this program, you can actually open up and see how we did what we did. If you like the mice but wanted to change a parameter, you could download that from Compadre if you've got easy Java simulations on your computer, right click on the running simulation and actually take all that information to see how it was actually done. We do have a set of uh, teacher modifiable versions where basically all you do is change checkboxes and you can save the simulation. So you don't even have to do this within easy Java simulations. There's a set in a filing cabinet that you can find on Compadre of about a dozen of these with associated curricular material. As I said, that we can use this also for teaching computational physics. And, and I talked a little bit about that. But one of the things to note is that we have the ability to do much more complicated things. You can actually write your own methods. I skipped over that. You can write your own code. We start by doing Euler method, where they actually write the code. And then once they do that in a second order algorithm and a third order al algorithm by hand, then we just use the built-in algorithms within uh, within EJS. You can also connect input-output. Uh, you can also do parallel programming within easy Java simulations. 
So it's a very full functioning tool. Uh, one of the nice examples that I like to talk about is that I had a student a few years ago who was doing our advanced physics class, advanced experimental physics class, and my computational physics class at the same time, and said, I want to do the same thing. I want to do the same topic in both. So what we came up with after a literature church search is what's called the swinging Atwoods machine. So you've got an at, you know, you know, a typical Atwoods machine, a pulley, and it just does that, and then it stops, basically. Well, if you start one side swinging, you can get periodic motion. There's a paper in the American Journal of Physics about this. What she did was did a bunch of simulations that showed with the specific starting points in the actual paper that you could get the patterns that they said, but then also took videos of an actual swinging Atwoods machine in lab and used Tracker to do the video analysis. And then the last thing that she did was, why aren't the two the same? So she had to try and model what was going on with the actual swinging Atwoods machine in terms of where she needed to change parameters, add friction, so that what she saw in the video, the uh, simulation of the real swinging Atwoods machine would actually show. Um, we have a lot of uh, how to teach computational physics. Wolfgang Christian, Jan Tabachnik, and Harvey Gould have a book, but there's also a version of that which is geared towards working with easy Java simulations, and that's on the open source physics side as well. So anything else, this is where we get to the speculative part of the talk, which is perfect because we only have a minute or so left. Um, one of the things that we've done is that since we have these materials, they're ours, and we can decide what we want to do with them. That what we've done is that we've created um, what we're calling, well, we've got ebooks, we're calling Java Edition. And basically, what these books do, and we haven't distributed them publicly yet, but we've been testing them in house, is if you're on a desktop or a laptop, you can open these electronic books, they're EPUB 3 formats, and read the books like text. Every time there's a link, you click the link, it'll open up in your browser the simulation on the Compadre Digital Library. And that works for desktop and laptop. This runs on tablets too, with the exception of the fact that tablets don't run Java. So one of the things that we've, we're also doing is working on creating new easy Java simulations, simulations that are in JavaScript. And I'll show you uh, an example of that. One of the things that we have that you can get also on the Easy Java Simulation site from downloads is a beta or alpha of what's called the Easy Java Simulations Reader. So I'm on an Android tablet. It'll soon to be on iDevices. It's one of the things where Android was actually easier than working on the iPad, which usually doesn't happen, at least not for me. Um, so basically what you can do let me see what I actually want to do. Let me do this first. Is that since I'm connected to the web, I can click the little library icon. And what it's doing is it's going to the open source physics collection on Compadre, and it's looking for JavaScript simulations. There's a little uh, drop down here, so I can go to astronomy and also fundamentals and night sky. And what I find is naked eye, sidereal, and solar day model. And what I can do is I can click download. So what I'm doing from the digital library from this app is actually downloading a simulation, a JavaScript simulation. That was the description. Here's the simulation, and I'll play it. I'll show the moon as well here. It basically tries to simulate the motion of the stars, the sun, and the moon from the standpoint of thinking about naked eye astronomy. Now, this is like watching paint dry because it's very, very slow, so we have this way to speed it up. So you can see that the, the rates for the sun, the moon, and the stars are different. Difference between a sidereal day, a solar day, the difference between a sidereal month and a synodic month. Um, from classical mechanics, I know we have in Newton's second law, we've got a Ferris wheel. And I'll just uh, quickly show you that. And I will download it also. So here's a Here's a Ferris wheel. It's got sliders so you could speed it up, slow it down. 
And one of the neat things about it is that besides speeding up and slowing down, I can click on this little show the free body diagram. So I can do a dynamic free body diagram. Okay. The other thing I can do is I can save these on this device uh, if I wanted to in one of my folders so I can work offline. We currently have about between a dozen and two dozen JavaScript simulations. Remember, they fit kind of our paradigm, one simulation, one idea kind of thing. Um, but we're working on, on creating a lot more with the new version of the Easy Java Simulations tool. And like I said over here, that it's going to come to, this app will come to iDevices as soon as Paco can figure out what, what's not working for him there. Okay. So possible issues, any questions? So we have a minute or two for questions, and then you have snack time out there. Yes? The way you made the massive strength, I don't know if it's because it was quick. It wasn't really intuitive. Yeah, because I've got the easy Java mm -hmm. simulator, and I don't know like, what's <laughs> okay. So, OK, so I did it very quickly to just show you that, OK? If you go online, there are tutorials both on the easy Java simulations site and also on the Compadre site. There is a set of videos um, by a guy at Francis Marion University who uses Easy Java simulations to teach computational physics. And what he has is a kind of a step by step. So I went quickly just to show you that it could be done quickly, what I was focusing on. When I do this with students, and uh, when I do this in our classical mechanics class where the goal is not to do computational physics it's to study classical mechanics that what we do is we do like a 15 minute we start with just getting the object on the screen get it to move at a constant speed we might do we might do what somebody suggested here when they said omega is we might instead of doing a dynamic model we might just do kinematics where we do x is equal to amplitude times cosine omega t to start out with so we slowly build uh, what we're doing. But there are, there are tons of tutorials, both on the Easy Java Simulation site and the Open Source Physics site uh, for that, PDFs as well as videos. Are there any other questions? Yes? So this is on Vip and Mill. Uh, for seniors, uh, which, for, for, for teaching computational physics, which language do you use? So we use Java. So we teach in Java. It's just what we've, we've done. It's an object-oriented language. Pretty much, if you learn, and, and people can attack me for saying this all they want, no matter what your students are going to do, when they go somewhere else, whatever you've picked, 99% of the time, it's not what they're going to use at the new place. You know, I had students do, do we did uh, Mathematica is what, what I use. They go somewhere else, and it's MathCAD or MATLAB. They figure it out. So you, you're trying to give them the overarching framework. And so I think as long as it's a modern uh, object-oriented language, it probably doesn't matter too much. Um, because they're going to go somewhere else, and it's not going to be whatever you taught them. But they have to have you know, the, the ability to see the big picture. So if you did Java and they're doing C or C++, I mean, we have people who a few years ago did summer internships and they were doing COBOL or something. You know, I mean, they're, 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 there's little, little chunks of people who keep doing the same thing over and over again. So depending on where you go, you might have to learn something different. The students will anyway. So I think picking a good object-oriented language. And getting them, the great thing about easy Java simulations, I have half my students who've done some computation, half that haven't. And within a week, they're basically all at the same level which is really nice. The people who are, have done some stuff before, they can just go do crazy stuff immediately. But you're not leaving behind the people who have never done any computation, which is really nice. You had a question. There's a similar question about comparing uh, Python or Java. So there's something that's So you think it helps of deductive you know, for teaching computation of physics. It's like more uh, Python for a class. So, so I know that. So a lot of people use vPython for, for teaching uh, low-level computational physics. The problem is you're, you're stuck with what algorithm is, is useful. Um, here, you can actually study the effect of different algorithms, whether you're worried about 
is does it conserve energy, does it not? And, and with a lot of the, the other simpler tools, you're stuck with Euler, which means the only thing you can do is make the time step smaller and smaller and smaller and hope that it still works. So here you can actually study the difference between a first order algorithm, a second, a third, and to see what happens with the error. And then also study, I now have a final project. Which one of the solvers should I use? Which one's going to work best? So you can actually do a lot more kind of computation um, with a more sophisticated set of tools.